So um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am attending this webinar from the land of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Stolo, and Tsleil-Waututh, sorry, um, nations. Um, knowing that this event draws attendees from all over the North America, I'm assuming, um, if not the world, that we will be on different territories. So please take a moment to look outside your window and reflect on the land upon you, which you reside and the peoples who have come before. Um, I'm Patricia Sia, Director of Academic Innovation at Langara College, and I'm the current president of SLA Canada. So this is um, a welcome. SLA Canada is a community of the Special Libraries Association that was created in 2020 with the merger of the Canadian Western Toronto and Eastern Canada chapters. We, wanted, we want to expand our strong network of librarians to include people who work outside the typical library settings. Our librarian competencies provide a framework to thrive in traditional and evolving settings or to ensure a rich career in working outside the box. So the future of the information profession lies in collaborating under a broader tent. And now it's up to us to forge our path, learn from each other and to make it happen. So I encourage you to join SLA if you haven't already and to make sure that your membership links to SLA Canada community. There's no extra cost for joining multiple communities either. So robust programming is one way to work and learn together. So thank you everyone who has taken the time from your busy days to present and, and also to attend this event. And thank you, especially to Dysart and Jones for making the technology and this virtual session possible. So I'm going to turn it over to Jane to introduce um, the program itself. You're on mute, Jane. Right, I muted myself. <laughs> oh, thanks, Patricia. It's wonderful to have you as our uh, uh, chapter or community um, uh, head this year. And uh, after one year of uh, of the SLA Canada, we're we're pretty happy with uh, our direction and where we're going. I just typed a little. Uh, note and it probably had spelling because I did it too quickly but just to say you know hello to everyone and ask where you're from we know quite a few people on the call which is fantastic and we hope that you will meet others in in uh, the conversation today around uh, technology for information and uh, content management and uh, <clears throat> Maria Phipps and, and Lawrence uh, Folland are here to to talk with us, both of whom have been, you know, around technology, around special librarians and other librarians for uh, uh, quite a few years. And um, I'm going to uh, let them start by telling you a little bit about themselves. But before we do, I want to assure you that the slides actually will be available afterwards, as will the recording of this uh, session. So. You don't have to furiously take notes, but uh, if you want to, you can definitely do that. So uh, let's start with uh, Maria and let her tell you a little bit about herself. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you everyone, particularly to Patricia, to Jane and to Rebecca for inviting us to this session. It's wonderful to be part of an SLA session. I haven't done this in, in a number of years. I've had a little hiatus from some of the things we were doing. And uh, so now we're back and it all happened one day because Jane ha happens to have a daughter in this geographic area and she was close by, so we reconnected. So it was lots of fun to be able to do that. So thank you uh, very much. So I'll just give a little bit of background and then I'll pass it over to Lawrence and we'll do our back and forth thing uh, for the presentation. So way back in 1981 is when I created uh, Phipps and Associates Inc. And uh, then another little company called the Computing Experience uh, at that time. And we've been providing information brokerage services with Phipps Inc. And then created the Computing Experience because we saw a financial opportunity. If you can believe it, corporations only had an IBM computer with two floppy drives, which cost $5,500. So, um, we were in a fortunate position that we did a bit of venture capital raising and we got all kinds of wonderful new equipment together in our nice storefront. And we began to introduce corporations, children and adults 
to computers and we would actually teach um, people in companies like Omark, which is a, a mixed chainsaws here in Guelph, how to use a computer. And that's what we were doing in those days. One of the earliest employees I had was Lawrence. And um, we're still working together today, which is pretty remarkable. Our services were from technology education to corporations, as I said, adults and kids, which I see I repeated, but that's okay. Um, we became the distributor for InMagic software in uh, way back in about 1986. And this allowed us to provide corporate libraries and archives with automation systems. InMagic also allowed us to design a large variety of bespoke information solutions. Um, beyond the corporate library, because in those days only DBase was available and it was really difficult for just regular folks to use. Uh, the next slide, please, Rebecca, thank you. So we also sold other information software solutions such as Eloquent Systems, Quadra, ProSight, and Sutron. The knowledge of managing digital assets started with us in about 1990 with the Toronto Port Authority uh, that um, had about you know, thousands of photos on two optical drives. Um, and their question was, how can we look up those images on the optical drives? Um, and so we built an Imagic database to link us out to that. In 2007, uh, we continued on and became really interested in digital matters. And we partnered, which we still are with the Internet Archive, to provide digitization of yearbooks to private schools and to universities. This is great fun, actually, and you can go online and look at your yearbook probably um, pretty much no matter what university you went to and uh, maybe some of the schools you went to. We used in Magic and Eloquent Archives to manage the digital content used for alumni engagement as well. So there was a fundraising component there. 2019, uh, we created FIPS Photo Management, which complemented some of our digital um, background and expertise. And that's a whole fun story in itself. I've also been very active for 30 years in board governance for a variety of organizations and corporations. And I'm also um, a part-time uh, Lake Superior um, ambassador and sometimes lighthouse keeper in my spare time. So that's a bit of an update there. Lawrence, over to you. Thanks, Maria. So as Maria said, uh, I started working with Maria back in 85 to about 91. Um, did a lot of different projects. Uh, I always enjoyed the challenge of uh, working with clients and trying to get things to work for them. Um, particularly libraries uh, under SLA or Canadian Association Law Libraries. So for me, this feels a little bit of coming home because this was the client base that I worked with a lot. Um, we did library stuff, but we did all kinds of interesting projects. Um, and uh, Maria mentioned DBase and I created a product called Data Magician to convert data from DBase to InMagic way back when. Um, added a whole bunch of other utilities to it, added mark record handling, and then sold it all over the world. So I had people all over the world using it, um, and that was a lot of fun. And uh, I still have an InMagic client that I work with to this day. It's not a library, they uh, a vet histology company, and they're still using InMagic in a database I set up in DOS 30-something years ago. Uh, now it's in Windows and, and modern, but... Um, I moved on uh, after uh, working with Maria to Dynex Library Systems, which I'm sure a lot of you will recognize. Um, I did uh, systems training, data conversions, but which was my specialty, uh, as well as system installations, installing terminals and barcode readers and everything. Um, but I did uh, take 10% time off and worked every other week uh, doing projects with Maria because I did find those uh, quite enjoyable, uh, the challenge of those and uh, being creative. And then back in 2003, I decided to go uh, get out of the corporate world. Uh, Dynex was being bought and sold by different companies and has changed many times. And uh, I wanted to go into uh, the university environment. So I've been working there since 2003. Uh, that's been really exciting. Um, I'm a technical manager in the School of Computer Science. I get to work with some of the really coolest, latest technology. Um, supporting researchers, we, we get big grants and we help them set up the computers and help their grad students with, with everything from laptops to high performance computing. Uh, go to the next slide, please, Rebecca. And so I started with a team of two staff. We've now got about 10, 10 staff with co-op students. Um, we set up some million dollar clusters. Uh, I hired a PhD in physics who's an amazing guy who 
who can build almost any kind of computer system. And some of that stuff I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, but that's it's been a really interesting uh, uh, and challenging, but very rewarding. Uh, but I still do uh, dabble a bit, work with Maria on occasionally on some projects and uh, quite interested in um, the work that I did in the past. Um, I've also, I didn't say it there, but I, for the past year, I've been the president of our staff association. And that's been particularly interesting and challenging given this COVID year. Um, my hobbies is still computers. That's how I got into this in the first place. So I do work with them, but I also play with them. And I see that uh, somebody added in a bit about writing computer games. I, for my own grandchild, I set up a little fun game uh, they could play online together. And I set up one for Jane and Maria as well for their grandchildren. Uh, but otherwise I enjoy sailing, skiing, and I play in a classic rock band um, called Radio Memories. That's a bit about me. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you both. <clears throat> and it's just so funny. Um... Lawrence, so many of the, the people in the library business are also in the music uh, business. We had a panel uh, um, last year and we ended up, it turned out that we had two drummers on the panel. It was just, it was really, and neither one of them knew each other played the drums, but uh, exciting with the way that, uh, that we all work. But um, uh, I want to just, uh, before we go into this uh, first question, I wanted to ask Maria again about the internet archive work, because that's really interesting around alumni. And I wonder if that's something that, um, that we might be able to look at for our library schools across Canada. SLA Canada is really focusing on getting our student groups uh, more active and um, interactive. And so, you know, my, even reaching out to alumni might be interesting too. Is that something you think we might be able to do? I think that would be an interesting opportunity. You know, I was delighted the other day when I listened to Gary Price's presentation from uh, the spring 2020, and he referenced the Internet Archive and uh, said some nice things about it near the latter part of his presentation. They are, for those of you uh, who aren't aware, they are located on the seventh floor of the Robarts Library uh, in Toronto. And uh, so they're right in our neighborhood. And those of you in San Francisco, that's where the headquarters is. And, and Deb, you're close to them there. They do all kinds of great things. And I do invite you to go and look at their website and see what they're doing. I know Brewster Kale spoke at OLA uh, a number of years ago. He calls me the uh, yearbook lady. Uh, <laughs> great. Which is okay. But uh, you do have a look. I think there's some great opportunities there and they're geographically very close to where the library school is as well. Well, that's terrific, thanks. And uh, as Maria referenced, um, the reason that we got doing this was because that we reconnected uh, after a uh, a while. It turns out that our, our sons are our best friends too, which was quite illuminating to us as we didn't realize it right off the bat. But uh, um, it's, it's interesting. And Maria mentioned to me about Lawrence and his looking into, you know, new technology. So that's, that's how we came together to, to have this uh, conversation. And uh, one of the first things I wanted to, to talk about, since it's on everybody's mind these days, some organizations, um, you know, were further ahead in, uh, in being um, uh, receptive to the world of uh, remote working, but others were not so um, enabled and uh, had a bit of a struggling start. And I know that they're, they're definitely moving along, but I wanted to hear, you know, a little bit from, from you two about what you've been seeing or hearing. I know Lawrence, maybe you'd like to start because uh, you said that um, the university did pivot quite well and uh, get up and running. Yeah, uh, for sure. So when we first went to, um, to remote uh, March 16th, um, they gave, they had to make fairly quick decisions and they decided uh, they gave all the faculty two weeks to get prepared to do online lectures. And while the university was well set, we had a lot of courses started to be available online. Um, we had a lot of good network, networking infrastructure. We had uh, teams for uh, connecting. Um, it, it was a big challenge for faculty uh, and staff for doing all the training and communicating with students, uh, doing coursework, how to handle exams, how to handle labs. Um, there were a lot of challenges. 
And, uh, and the university has always been known as being a big, slow beast. So mm -hmm. the fact that we were able to change in two weeks, completely change and turn around our way of, uh, of um, providing lectures to students uh, was really quite amazing. And of course, and, and it happened all over, all over North America, universities, large institutions handled this uh, incredibly. And I, I think we were, I mean, in a weird way, we were fortunate with the timing. Uh, networking has increased. Um, people have gotten more comfortable uh, with this kind of remote learning, but people weren't really comfortable. And I, I do know that uh, I, at one point I made a joke to our central IT people and said, so was this really an elaborate hoax just to get everybody onto Teams and accept it? Um, because a lot of people were not comfortable with this kind of work. And uh, I noticed a question about, do students feel remote is better? Um, I'm gonna say my son went off to, he's currently at Fleming College and, and he interestingly became the president of his student association. And uh, at the same time being challenged with having to handle COVID and, and he found it very difficult and he was concerned about being a student in this time. And I would say it's been a challenge. I don't think it's as rewarding an experience in a lot of courses, he's in environmental uh, studies, wildlife studies, and it's hard to do that work. So some of it, they're doing some of it online, uh, some of it hands-on, um, uh, small group work and the university did do some small group work in the fall, small classes, but yeah, it is not the full experience. And there's a pretty good simulation of a lot of it, but there is a lot of, uh, a lot to be desired. Yes, and I think, uh, see Annalise saying about missing in-class interactions. I think this is the thing for everyone. Um, we miss the in-person, and I, I know there's a question later about that, about connecting. Um, so this is kind of the best we can do given the situation. But the fact that the university, at least Waterloo managed to keep us all employed, uh, all working, um, keep the students coming, that was the big goal. How do you make sure students will register? Waterloo, as you may be aware, we're heavily um, dependent on our international students, especially from China. So we needed to not only make sure that they could take courses, but they had the technology to do it and that they could get deal with the, the Great Firewall of China and still access the course materials. So there were a lot of challenges. Um, in the summer, the university hired 300 co-op students specifically to help uh, faculty with uh, course development and delivery. But it's, it's challenging, I think, uh, for a lot of people. Yeah, Maria, did you want to make some comments? And I just wanted to say thank you to people who are putting their um, observations and experiences in the, uh, in the chat and questions as well. I meant to encourage you to do that off the top, but thank you for, for doing it anyway. Maria? Yes, thank you, Jane. Um, so yes, I would like to make a couple of uh, comments on that. So Lawrence has experience with the University of Waterloo, sort of I think North America's, maybe can't, the world's best computing uh, university. Um, I've been on the Board of Governors for 10 years for uh, Lakehead University, and we're in Northwestern Ontario with a campus in Orillia. So Lakehead had a lot of skill in terms of remote working because of the two campuses. Um, so they were able to move quite quickly and faculty were already experiencing teaching online in Aurelia. We also have the Northern Ontario Medical School, uh, which is also very, it has two campuses, one in Sudbury and one in Thunder Bay. So those students have always been used to having to share. And so that has gone actually quite well. And when you are in Northwestern Ontario, you get really used to remote stuff uh, because, you know, there's not a lot of places around. You can't pop down to McMaster or other universities or bigger centers. In terms of corporations and other clients that I've been working with, some have had a really tough time. And I think, I think it's the IT departments for some of our clients I've been working with that have maybe had the hardest time because they, they haven't wanted to let go. So you might take an organization that has a library and an archive. And so IT, you know, kind of handles everything. And then suddenly the archive or the library has to do everything online with its communities. And IT then has to pass over a bit of the baton and let them do Zoom or let them download other applications that they don't want downloaded onto their systems. 
I see that as having been a challenge for a number of organizations. And I'll be interested to know if anyone else has, you know, encountered that in their um, in their uh, libraries or archives. Good. Yeah, we'll get people talking in a little bit, but <clears throat> let's move on to the next uh, question that we were uh, looking at, Rebecca. Now I can't remember what that was. <laughs> we'll put it up on the screen. <laughs> there we go. So question one and question two. Oh, yeah. Collaboration technology. We um, uh, were involved in the KM World Conference last uh, November, and, uh, you know, it's a lot around collaboration, and, and uh, organizations have used um, uh, Yammer and Slack and very other, very, um, various other technologies to try and, uh, you know, get people to collaborate and build communities, et cetera, and, and make available what knowledge is necessary when you need it, you know, so you could just dip into an intranet and grab out, you know, what you need as you need to make a decision. But, um, you know, it's always been about the people and getting people to, you know, engage in those uh, technologies. And I'm wondering if there's if you've seen any, you know, changes or developments in the in the in the last uh, year or so around collaboration uh, technologies. Lawrence, do you want to go ahead on that one to start with? Um, it's just reading a couple of comments there. Um, yeah, I think as I as I joked, you know, uh, this really got us using Teams, and I mean, I think. The, one of the interesting things about a university, of course, again, because it's very decentralized, people use a lot of different things. And I was reading one of the articles, uh, I think it was talking about um, how Shopify um, started using um, was it Slack, I think. Um, and the challenge we have is trying to get everybody going into the same thing. So um, as I mentioned, we're using Teams and Teams has a number of elements. Um, uh, to it, it has the, the, the chat, but it also, and, and the video, uh, but also has a file system and sort of a corporate teams, all kinds of different teams where people can talk. And, and people have been making good use about it. I've been trying to promote uh, on campus more ability for people to communicate with each other across campus, especially the IT folk, because that's the area that I'm in, but uh, the community at large. And because there's so many different ways that people can communicate and so many different ways that people store information, um, it can be a challenge. Um, Teams has helped with the communication, but I was thinking about this knowledge management and storage of documents. So, you know, we have websites, we have SharePoint, we have Teams, we have Twikis, we have our ticketing systems, which have their own knowledge bases in them. Um, and so the problem is not whether we have the information, it's where to find it. And this is where I think um, this group uh, has that professional view. And in a corporation, you might have a, a better chance of saying, this is how we're going to do it. And that's how, how to do it. The problem is we have everybody uh, and their brother and sister coming up with their own way that they think documents should be stored and found. And, and that is a real challenge. And I don't know if it's getting better. Um, I kind of think not. But um, <laughs> remotely, it's really clear you need to be able to access that information and have a good way of getting getting a handle on it. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I, I think maybe, um, uh, hopefully we'll get a couple of our, uh, uh, people talking after, you know, we've had our initial chat because I know, uh, Tom from the Missionary Institute, they've been doing some interesting things around with teams and, uh, uh, SharePoint and collaboration within that institution. And, uh, um, I'm, I think Cindy Hill has, uh, some pretty interesting, uh, ones as well. So maybe you too, be prepared that I might call on you a little bit later. <laughs> Maria, comments before we move on to the next well, question? Thank you. Um, so one of, the, one of the terms that Jane used in a conversation Lawrence and I had with her uh, on Sunday was a term that Lawrence and I actually had to look up and ask Jane for a bit of clarification. And that was great. Um, knowledge in the flow. And there was a great CAM magazine article that uh, I'm sure um, Jane and Rebecca can pro provide the reference to. And, you know, the question is, as Lawrence just said, how will, will we ever have knowledge in the flow? As we create it, will be very simple and straightforward that what we're working with will be automatically coming part of this knowledge base. And I, I, don't, I don't think we're, we're there yet. 
Um, I've had the pleasure over the prior to 2016 of being involved in some CAN seminars with Deb Hunt and um, Tony Sadat and when we were doing those seminars together. Um, that was a great experience. And when you hear and read about KM, it's so exciting. But honestly, when you try it internally, there are, it's got to do with the people. There are so many hazards along the way of trying to get there. I think there's a lot of good systems in place, a lot of good technology, but we just have to work with people. Maybe what we're in right now, the situation, will let people think about, oh, well, maybe, you know, I shouldn't be so um, set in my ways about how I want to manage information. So maybe some good will come out of that, but it's very complex. Yep. Yep. All right. What were we going to talk about next, Rebecca? Well, I was, just, I was just going to add in that, oh. uh, you know, knowledge in the flow on the Forrester predictions for 2021, their research shows that one in four information workers will by the end of 2021 be uh, using and having AI and other bots that are like uh, integrated into their work. So. And actually that might be our next question right. <laughs> around AI. I, I can't quite remember because, you know, that was again in our uh, KM world last, uh, last year, there was a, a huge discussions around AI and the number of, uh, of cool authors from Harvard Business to um, uh, Early and Associates and and others who you know talked about AI and the fact that it's really you know moving the bar in terms of the um, what's happening. In fact, um, one of the examples I used was uh, Moderna, the the um, a drug for uh, COVID, and apparently they call themselves a technology company that happens to be in the biotech area. And they said the only reason that, it, that they've been able to move so quickly on bringing that, that drug uh, along was because of uh, AI. So, uh, all right, yes, it was. Any thoughts around that, Maria and Lawrence? Lawrence, do you wanna start? Because I think you're doing some at your institution. I have some examples too. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I mean, I don't myself get directly involved other than I'm often supporting the researchers who are doing this kind of work. So we have a very robust AI department uh, at um, Waterloo in computer science. Um, one project that I was mentioning to Maria and Jane was uh, there was a health doc project that uh, uh, Professor Chrisanne DeMarco uh, was leading that we were supporting, providing the infrastructure for. Um, and it was doing analysis of medical pamphlets and documentation. So it would read through massive amounts of materials and then customize um, um, for clients who might have a particular, um, particular ailment, um, a set of materials gleaned from all of that. And uh, so she did a lot of work in that area. Um, one of her team went on to create a tool for communicating Kind of a natural language communication with robotics this is a little bit separate from what we're talking about here but that just got bought by microsoft and uh so he came back and provided a an endowment to the school for um for, for the ai lab so uh but certainly a lot of our researchers who are into uh, big data uh, data structures um uh, they are doing this kind of research and it was interesting we were talking about the internet archive earlier and i'm going to mention something about one of my staff um, so one of my staff, uh, proposed we generate, create a large data store. So, um, and he figured we could build something about 200 terabytes, uh, using open source software and commodity hardware. And he's a PhD in physics. So I highly recommend PhDs in physics for, uh, high performance computing, uh, uh, work anyway. So he built that we're using that. We just got it built and we got approached by one of our faculty members who was using the uh, the Internet Archive as a um, um, a data source for for chewing through and looking for information, and so it was 100 terabytes. So we said, "Can we store this on site?" And we had just built this. It's like, okay, now we're going to use half of the capacity we just built, uh, but we could. We were able to handle it. So the ability to handle large data, and again, this is an issue for people because um, there are several factors with handling large data. One. Of course, is the physical capacity. Where are we going to put it? Two, 
if we're going to put it on a service such as Amazon S3, how much is it going to cost? Because that's where they had it and it was ferociously expensive to leave it there. Uh, three was the issue of access to it uh, because it was remote to read through 100 terabytes of data when you're writing code to chew through the data, it was too remote to make it efficient. Uh, so that's an issue. So being on site, we have um, uh, uh, 100 gig, let's see, how fast do we have that? 10 gig, 40 gigabit, 40 gigabit links to their desktop, um, to our data stores. So this is quite fast. So, um, you know, gigabit is fast to the home. We're doing 40 gigabit from the server in our server room to their desk. Um, so that's kind of nice. And then, um, and then finally is the issue of privacy or security of data. So a lot of people are uncomfortable about having data in the cloud. Uh, basically somebody else holding your data, whether it be Microsoft or Google or whoever. And so a lot of our faculty are concerned about that kind of thing. So all of these issues, you know, not everybody has the, you know, the resources to build their own large data store as we have, but it is a concern or a consideration for organizations as they're trying to farm their data, uh, how are they gonna do that? Uh, where is it gonna live and how are they gonna store it? Backing it up becomes a challenge, um, making sure you can handle failed disk drives. There's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of issues to deal with with that way. It's not exactly quite what you're talking about here, but basically this, this, the AI side is, is large data, um, and then routines to, to dig through it and be able to start generating algorithms that are useful to you. And I think there are lots of, of possibilities and opportunities. And I think that's going to be, you know, a big part of our future is that that handling of the data and the ability to do so in many ways for, you know, many industries, whether it's, you know, medical or, or biotech or whatever. Maria, I think you had a couple of comments there too. Thank you, yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think we will all agree that uh, the term search is king, uh, is what we're all about and is very important. And again, referring back to Gary Price, um, we kind of came across with that in his presentation. And with AI, search is king because if we have AI, then it'll be easier to find stuff. So I did a quick, uh, quick review of the library automation systems, uh, big, small, in between, and um, because that's what I know a little bit about. And then went to my good colleague and um, friend, Graham Beestall in the UK uh, with Sutron and, and asked him like, what are you doing? Because I couldn't really find anything that whether it was Dynex or Lucidia or any of those people were doing. But, so I asked Graham and he said, yeah, we, we are overlaying, we have an AI um, plugin that we have developed now for Sutron that they're using in, in England. Um, and it's able to do everything we want it to do. And it's an extra program that they've overlaid uh, on top that works at that, as that search engine. It's called Ask Sutron. So it's called Artificial Intelligence Inquiry Management Solution. And, um, and they've got apparently great, I haven't tested it. I, I haven't had a chance, but they are finding that it's working really well and they have a good number of installations in, in Europe. So I think the, what Marshall Breeding was saying in his 2020 library uh, automation survey is that there were a lot of mergers of corporations this year and blah, 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 so on and so forth. And the, the sort of stagnant in terms of development because you know every automation system can search, can do whatever it's supposed to do. But this is maybe a whole new area that the library automation vendors um, are, I'm thinking, are looking at and working and how can they expedite those uh, to our, to our uh, libraries. And, and I haven't read anything about them yet. This seems to be pretty quiet on that side, but I think it's gonna be a really interesting area to watch. And there are gonna be all kinds of solutions. So if you have a library automation vendor in your library, um, why don't you ask whoever you do support with or wherever your contact is uh, in that organization, in that company and say, hey, you know, what are you guys doing? Because by the way, knowing a little, having a little bit of experience with library software development, I think Lawrence would echo this. We do rely on, those vendors do rely on you, the end users for input. I know it in Magic Karen Brothers, 
always kept uh, dreams and wishes uh, wish list in, in, in a magic for years so that, you know, you asked a question 75 times, you might might get it. In <laughs> so um, keep that in mind. And, and I think you could be uh, helpful in implementing some of this with your uh, with your suppliers. Thank yeah, you. I think that's that's great, um, Marie. I think uh, you know what we heard from a lot of the um, the the knowledge management uh, vendors and suppliers uh, last November is that many of them are working with AI to do some of these things. So hopefully, we'll be hearing more about those uh, in the future. You mentioned uh, Gary Price and. Uh, I just wanted to uh, put a plug in because Gary has just become the SLA Canada oh. uh, intelligence officer. And he's gonna do a couple of uh, those updates that you uh, looked at uh, Maria a year. And uh, the first one for this year is actually going to be our monthly meeting at the end of uh, February. So the end of uh, next month, Gary will be giving us his update of uh, things that we should be looking at and thinking about, et cetera. And in addition to that, he's going to be giving us a monthly uh, alert, um, intelligence report, briefing about things that we special librarians in Canada need to be aware of, exposed to, et cetera. So he is going to be our intelligence officer and we are very excited about it. So. We'll be seeing him Here's next him. month. <laughs> okay, what was the next thing we were gonna talk about, Rebecca? Oh yes, missing everybody. <laughs> Not having the in-person uh, connection with our, our communities and uh, ways to reach out. I think Lawrence, you mentioned something a bit earlier. Do you wanna start with a few comments there? I'm just trying to think of what that was, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I see people everywhere trying to figure out ways to keep connected. I mean, there's keeping connected personally and socially, and then also uh, work-wise. Um, work-wise, um, you know, in my role as both an IT manager and then also being a, a staff association, um, I had a lot of meetings and I can tell you uh, the university campus is a pretty big place. And so I'd often find myself running from one building across to another building. Mm. And, and in some ways, the fact that I can switch from a meeting at, you know, right on the hour from one meeting to the next is both good in the sense of I can get to the next meeting. It's bad in the sense that I may be sitting in my chair for hours at a time going meeting to meeting to meeting and not getting up and moving around. We certainly miss that. Um, one thing I have found, uh, when I was back in my Dynex days and, and Maria days, um, I did a lot of remote support. So connecting and talking to somebody right. and then sharing a screen. Right. <clears throat> that usually involves certain special software that not a lot of people were comfortable with or familiar with. Nowadays with Teams or Zoom, sharing a screen seems the second nature. It's really easy to show you what I'm doing. And I think people have gotten better at that. So connecting with a client I, and I'd be really interested to hear how people are doing this in the, in the special library world, you know, in a way, uh, because a lot of your clients might have been remote um, offices were, you know, multiple locations. And the fact that you can easily share a screen, um, which IT folks have done for a long time, but sort of regular folk did less of, we used WebEx way back when, um, and some other tools. But now the fact that people just share your screen, show you what you're doing, um, I would imagine that would actually help um, connect with clients that you can show them, here's what I'm doing, because often it's almost can be an interactive process as you're trying to help somebody find something. And I just, I, I was curious what people's thoughts were on that and getting a little feedback from, from our group here. And uh, is it helping in some yeah. ways? You know, I mean, it's nice to sit and work with somebody, but I find there's a lot of that connectivity now that people might not have been used to uh, this way. So. Just some thoughts there. Yeah, before we ask some of our uh, audience uh, to comment, uh, Maria, did you have uh, uh, some comments there? Thank you. I have a couple of things to throw out uh, on that. One thing I want to mention um, that's really exciting for interaction is a product called Remo, R-E-M-O. And it's something that our photo managers uh, group, the lead person, Kathy, uh, 
Nelson in Connecticut discovered when we couldn't have our conference in March. And what I think we can do all the Zoom stuff, and I know Zoom's got rooms and uh, Board of Meeting has rooms as well, but what they don't have is this ability that Remo does, and Google it and see what you think of it, is to um, allow tables where you can go and sit. Like you, when you're at a conference, you go over this table, that table, you see your buddies over here, over there, and you want to do that in the same kind of graphic interactive way. Remo right. allows you to do that, and we use it two, three times a week with you know 80 or 90 people. So look that yeah. up. Has yeah, I'm just I'm going to stop you there for a second because that is what SLA used for its uh, global conference last October. So maybe people would uh, comment in the chat if you uh, had a chance to to use that Remo and what your experience uh, was. I think people really liked the idea that they could move in uh, for um, uh, tables, etc. Oh, Deb has just commented that the AIIP conference in April is also going to use the Remo platform. So, yep, there we go. Okay. We go. Great way of connecting. So yeah. just a last quick comment, because I'm watching the time. Um, so one of the things I think that we can do to improve our communications is to really have a look at our skills. What are we able to do as, as librarians? And in, in that regard, I'd like to refer to Deb Hunt's uh, and David Grossman's book, uh, The Librarian's Skill Book. And I, I had a, another look at it. And, you know, we all get really busy and we, we don't have time to really sometimes think about what we can and cannot do. Going back and looking at your skills and where you can develop them, I think in these COVID times, you're gonna have the opportunity to learn a bit more about yourself and um, how can you maximize building community uh, with what you have at this point in time. And I think it's, kind of an important thing to do and very helpful. Um, I did a brief literature review. I'm sure all of you have probably done this. There wasn't that much uh, out there. Uh, Jane did send us a good article that I hope she and Rebecca can put up called uh, Future Proofing Government Agencies in the Wake of COVID. I thought that was a great article. Um, and my last comment, and you've probably done this too, but one quick and effective way with your community to host a Zoom or whatever technology to prefer for Lunch and Learns. I know many of you at Lunch and Learns over the years, um, perhaps you're doing this, but again, a Lunch and Learn on using this or using that, because we, I think we are leaders in our organization on technology, even though sometimes the IT department doesn't quite acknowledge that. <laughs> that's my last comment. Uh, that's great, Maria. And I think too, that you know, our skill of, of sort of connecting people, you know, connecting people to people as well as to connecting people to knowledge, et cetera. I think those are um, uh, definitely the skills that we that we have. And uh, it's interesting, speaking of uh, skills, um, SLA is going to have a couple of uh, live chats at the Ontario Library Association Super Conference uh, early next month. And one of our chats is going to be around roles and, you know, using some of the new skills in, uh, in different ways. And you heard Patricia mention that, um, you know, we're, we're hoping that uh, SLA Canada will bring in more than just those special libraries who are in um, specific walls and called libraries because we have and we do use our skills in, you know, IT departments, in software development in you know all sorts of different ways so uh yeah i'm glad that you you brought up the skills and i'm going to um i'm going to ask uh rebecca if uh, she noticed anybody in the um in the chat who uh might want to come forward and give an example of uh of how they're using collaborative tech or um whatever i think tom at missioner might be the the first that we could uh perhaps uh, unmute Rebecca. Uh, and Tom, you can unmute yourself. Anybody can unmute themselves. There he is, I there see is. him. Hey, just gonna make sure my audio works. Uh, can everyone hear me good? All right, mm -hmm. I, see, I, hear, I see a lot of uh, nodding faces. Um, yeah, so we at the Mitchner have been using Microsoft Teams and SharePoint uh, since it would have been about, August or September of 
2019. Mm-hmm. The years are escaping me because of a COVID times. I've just been in my apartment forever now. Um, so yeah, so we started something called the Knowledge Management Project, um, where we were essentially tackling our institutions. Uh, difficulties with managing knowledge. Um, We had a shared drive that was very old and had been used for um, many generations of um, successive uh, employees, um, all with no direction about how to save files, no direction about even uh, things like um, file names, et cetera. There was no standardized way to do that. Uh, And what it did was it basically, it was like a grocery store with no aisles or organization, really. <laughs> there were some areas that people kind of understood, but when you really got into it, it just became became a nightmare. Um, and so the Knowledge Management Project really started as a way of tackling that problem. And what it evolved into was we realized it's uh, far easier to move everything into the cloud where things are searchable. But also, if we introduce additional layers of organization, uh, we can improve the efficiency of the organization uh, by a significant amount. Um, every, every minute that someone spends uh, searching different databases or trying desperately to find something is a, a minute of organizational money and time wasted, um, which when you work in uh, you know, the public health care system is something that uh, you want to avoid. So um, by by pursuing things like SharePoint, like Teams, and getting people used to the idea of working remotely before we were forced to work remotely and giving them the tools to do so effectively, we were able to uh, weather the pandemic's beginning um, with with relatively little difficulty. Uh, The only thing that we struggled with was um, because we were a library uh, in-person book delivery um, which was essentially put on hold and is still on hold, unfortunately. Um, but our students are, you know, they don't really use our uh, physical resources. They used our space as a place to study. Um, so that is the only major hurdle that we have faced. Uh, I went home on a Friday afternoon, not really knowing what to expect. And when I came back Monday morning, I found all my files exactly where I left them because I'd moved them to SharePoint. Um, and uh, of special note, the portfolio that we worked with, which was learning, innovation, and research, Um, which I would describe as effectively our faculty support and our educational support department, uh, as well as our evaluation department, um, because we'd worked with them very extensively uh, through the knowledge management project. And because we'd paid very special attention to the way that they worked um, through what I would describe as ethnographish uh, methods, um, which (laughs) equates to a whole ton of interviews uh, where we um, structured our approach for knowledge management based on their feedback. Uh, they were able to do very well. Um, And they did so well that we're now moving it into a larger, more structured approach for the entire organization. Because this was not something that came from the top. This was something that we did as a grassroots movement. Uh, And that's my OLA presentation. Um, Thank you for the the prep work. And he also, uh, by the way, is going to to do a a more in-depth talk about this at... uh, computers and libraries at conference uh, in March. So uh, there will be more details. Yeah, I can't give it all away right now. Yeah, that's um, right. You do, yeah, but it also goes to your point, Maria, that um, that libraries know this stuff and knows what needs to be done and their grassroots uh, is, a, is a fabulous example. And Rebecca, did we have somebody else that might wanna to speak or? Uh, well, there were many people that put in uh, you know, using Teams, uh, you know, various uh, tools. I put in uh, also the use of Mural, if anybody's used that. Um, it's fantastic for uh, bringing people together using Post-its, like it, uh, it's a digital, you can actually use it through Zoom for uh, group work. Uh, we use it both for teaching and for, um, uh, you know, client work. Uh, SharePoint Yammer, absolutely. Of course, you know, Microsoft owns a lot of this now. So that's why it's all incorporated in to uh, Microsoft Teams. Um, and uh, Sharon. And what did they call their new um, new product? Starts with a C, does it think? Now I can't think of it. Cash flow. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, my God. Oh, well, just flew out of my head. Sorry. Any other tools that people are using uh, with their uh, clients or with their colleagues? Or how you find working with your colleagues, as Lawrence uh, asked. 
you know, by by screen sharing or or whatever. Oh, Maria, you're muted. Oh, we have to ask you to unmute. Uh, ask you to unmute. There we go. There we go. <laughs> um, one of the one of the things that I learned in speaking to a few of our library colleagues in the past week is this entity in corporate libraries, particularly law libraries. I don't know if we've got anybody here from a law library. I think we had one or two from someone from Faskins. Is the mail uh, the mail in COVID times? So the law libraries. And I think tax libraries and other financial type libraries get the mail and you all know what the mail is and serials check in, you know, is a nightmare for the mail and it piles up and over the years, we had so many discussions in our office as to how to best do the mail. So anyway, I was asking this one law, law librarian friend of mine about the mail, the mail still arriving, uh, still piled up now they've ceased it. But when we actually ultimately get to the mail in each of those libraries, all those inserts and all those things we got to do for the tax report or whatever, are going to be a bit out of date. How do we handle the mail? You know, I mean, people are still looking for it. So I'm just going to leave you with that thought. What do we do? But, and some people want the hard copy CCH reporter and so on. So, right. What do we do with the mail in these days? Interesting thought very scary thought, but I think I see Cindy has unmuted. Did you want to make a comment, Cindy? I did. Um, Good. So I work at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, and there are 12 of us plus the board in Washington, D.C. And, and like everyone, we were just thrown into the, um, the work from home environment. And across our system, the librarians decided that we would use this as an opportunity to really learn how to use the tools that all of a sudden became rapidly available to us. So we had been using Skype for our Skype meetings, whether it was video or voice, and we were really comfortable with it. But then all of a sudden we were given Teams and we were given WebEx and we were given Zoom, three new tools in less than two weeks. And we made the decision bank by bank and then as a system to learn together while we were having meetings. So we made it a conscious um, learning process instead of a haphazard or accidental learning process. And I can say now after several months, those people that resisted and wanted to stay with Skype and Skype voice only, and you know, no faces, <laughs> that we've seen probably a 50 to 60 percent adoption rate of having visual especially when they're speaking or they're interacting. Um, so I was, I was really quite um, gratified to see my colleagues step into this learning opportunity in addition to all the other things we were dealing with. And I was really pleased to hear, and I forgot, oh, Thomas's comment about the academic library collection still being closed because that's, that is our biggest stumbling block right now is figuring out how to get access to that. And our solution has been to buy the books. Right. So, and ship them directly to the person with the note that, you know, when we come back to the office, if ever, <laughs> please return your book and we'll get it. We've already have it in the collection. It's checked out to you forever, but bring it back. But we figure there's going to be a cost loss there. But on the technology side, I've been really pleased with how rapidly the Federal Reserve provided new tools for us. You know, the opportunity presented itself and they took advantage of it instead of saying, whoa, we're yeah. the Fed, we, we need to move slow. It was no, we're the Fed, we need to move fast and be agile. Right. Oh, that's fantastic. Thanks, Cindy, for sharing that. That's yeah. really, really, really good. Which also Thank speaks you. to, you know, one of the things that the uh, business predictions are all saying, which is uh, the need to reinvent the supply chain because yes. strategy has to be digital first. So the whole yes. digital strategy, which is physical uh, digital experiences, and that includes reinventing that supply chain so that you are cutting out the labor costs to uh, uh, improve the supply cost, the supply cost. I'm oh, glad you brought that up, Rebecca, because that's one of the things that, that uh, she and I have been talking about for computers and libraries in March is a talk around one, you're looking at new programs and services that you create it digitally first. And yes, if it works in person, fine, but start with the digital. And that's, I guess, too, what, what Rebecca is referring to is that supply chain 
to make that happen. Um, only have a couple of minutes left. It's amazing how fast our meetings go. But before we finish off, I just wanted to ask uh, Maria and Lawrence if you had a couple of uh, uh, co finishing off comments. <laughs> Lawrence, go ahead. Oh, he said to me to go. Okay. <laughs> I'll go first then. Okay. Um, uh, well, you know, it's a really exciting time. First of all, I think librarianship's been really exciting through all my 40 years of working uh, in the field. And now it's more exciting than ever. And I wish I was 35 still. Uh -huh. um, and I think many of us probably do because there is so much going on. So we're just gonna have to really compact everything we want into the next 10 or 12 years till in that case, I'll be like 84 or something. <laughs> um, but uh, but we, we are blessed to, to have this amazing profession and uh, I'm just so thankful to be part of it. And thank you again for inviting me. Over to you, Lawrence. Thanks, Maria. Yeah, I'd like to thank you for having me here today. It's uh, really nice to reconnect with this community. I have been out of it for uh, a few years now, but uh, it, it really is nice. And I, and I was thinking as Thomas was talking that uh, how much of librarianship, and again, I'm not a librarian, um, but uh, what I learned and saw over the years uh, has guided me as I think about how things are organized, gardening a Twiki um, and, and how files are stored and thinking about them in logical orders and with uh, you know some sort of dictionary or some sort of plan and layout. And that's how, how I think this profession can really help people keep their information organized, whereas the IT folks may not have that same idea about how to keep the information or how to retrieve the information. So I think this is uh, this has been great. I've really been uh, enjoyed being with you today, and uh, thank you for having me. That's great. Thank you because you, you know, we like to have people from different perspectives. And although you are, you know, not a librarian, Lawrence, you're library adjacent and. Uh, you see things in a different way, and and we need that. Uh, and and also both of you, you know, willing to share. I mean, that's that's the core of us as special librarians that we want to share, and we we like to talk, you know, tools and what we might be able to do better. And uh, it's all all about those things. And uh, and I also have to thank you since uh, you and Maria and I are. Um, of a certain age and all have four-year-old grandchildren, I just am thrilled with the um, uh, game that uh, Lawrence has put together using the uh, characters from the, uh, um, what are they? What, what are, now I'm totally they're blanked on these guys. Oh, the Paw Patrol guys. <laughs> yes. So, Thank you for that. And thank you both for being with us today. And as I mentioned, uh, this recording will be uh, up on the Dice Art and Jones uh, website. And uh, February's meeting is another update from, uh, from um, uh, uh, Gary. Gary, Gary Price. Price. See, am and, I losing my marbles, Rebecca? And next Tuesday is an extra chat with Dice Art and Jones with Stephen Abram and Brian Pitchman. Some yes. of you may know Brian, he is the uh, strategic director of the Evolve project. He is not a librarian and they are talking about trends in entertainment and technology uh, and why libraries should be looking at them. So we so, will hopefully see you then. Thank you so much, Maria and Lawrence and Jane. Great job. Thanks everybody. I'll get this recording up. Bye everybody. <laughs> Thanks Bye. a lot.